We uh, welcome everybody to our online services here on Sunday, April 19th. Just in case you've uh, gotten lost in track of time. And uh, if you're with us for the first time today, we welcome you uh, to our online services here at Woodland West. I want to share a couple of things that continue to go on with our church body on Sunday mornings at 9.30. We continue to... Uh, to have Phil and Tom do their respective Bible classes live on Facebook and on Zoom. And so check in with those guys if you'd like to get involved in those classes. We also have uh, Mr. Mike and Trey, or Mr. Trey and Mike, I guess you might say, that are doing their online uh, chats with their uh, youth ministries and uh, children's ministry and so be sure and check with them for login information about that. We did have uh, several folks share pictures again this week. And uh, so uh, we saw pictures from uh, Holly and Tony and their family uh, surrounding the TV, watching uh, uh, the worship service and being involved in it. We also had uh, Pat and Pat send us a pic. And then uh, also Randy and Andrew and the kids. And last but not least, uh, Alex Ratliff uh, joined in watching the announcements this last week. So uh, just from the uh, perspective of encouragement time, I don't have any new information about people that are uh, maybe in need of our chair sp prayers specifically. But I do want to uh, uh, share one thing I didn't. Uh, here uh, yesterday that the governor announced that our uh, schools are out uh, for the rest of the year. So there was kind of a collective groan, I think, that went out uh, yesterday. So be sure and keep our, our families and our parents in your prayers, especially 
uh, this week and in the weeks to come as they work through that uh, new dynamic that they are uh, uh, working through every, every week. Uh, that's really all I have from an announcement perspective. Uh, again, we sure do miss seeing every, all of you guys every week and the uh, direct interaction. I'm hoping that there's a light at the end of the tunnel based on uh, the things that we're seeing and hearing. And also, hopefully, in the coming weeks or so, uh, hopefully we'll be back to meeting together uh, every day. And also, uh, as we move into our worship time this morning, uh, let me share this reading with you from Psalms 27 today. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. At, this, at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful for, uh, for being in your dwelling place and for you bringing us there uh, this morning as we worship and praise, as we uh, make music to you, Lord. We are thankful for the opportunity. We praise your name uh, for all that you are and all that you're about. Lord, be with us today as we join our brothers and sisters from our homes in communion today as we remember uh, your death and burial and resurrection, the sacrifice that you made for each of us and the blood that you shed that washes us clean every day. Help us not to take that for granted, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and uh, especially in these times, help us to keep our eyes focused on serving others and looking for opportunities uh, to be your love and your gospel in this world. Father, thank you again for loving us. Bless this day today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Glad you're all here today with us. We hope that it's a great worship and praise day for you. Have a great day. See ya. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, From the depths of the sea. let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the, ends of the, earth. From the depths of the sea, From the depths of the sea. let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord.
There you are. It's good to see you this morning. You know, I think if I leave this mask on, you're going to have a hard time understanding what I say. So as long as you promise to stay with at least six feet away, I'm going to go ahead and take this off so we can have a conversation this morning. There. This is not my primary mask. My primary mask is a Texas Rangers mask made by Courtney Goff. Uh, Courtney has been one of several of our church family members who've been making masks. Um, unfortunately, this morning when I uh, was leaving, I couldn't find my primary mask, so I had to go to my secondary mask. We live in sort of interesting times where we not only have primary masks, we have secondary masks. Uh, and if you live in Dallas County, I think starting Saturday, or maybe Sunday, if you go out, you're required to wear a mask. Tarrant County's not quite there yet, but sort of an interesting time. Um, I brought some other things that, that I've used um, more, a lot more uh, the past three weeks than I've used uh, in a long time. Uh, gloves, actually, I'm not sure that I'd ever used these plastic gloves. These, Terry keeps these to clean for cleaning around the house. Uh, now I keep a pair in my car. Uh, so, now, I have used soap. I use soap regularly, but I think I have washed my hands more in the last 30 days than I would in a normal year. It feels like sometimes I'm washing them every 15 or 20 minutes. And disinfecting wipes. Um, I can honestly say I've used more of these in the last 30 days than I have probably in my whole life. Um, interesting times. Well, welcome to, uh, to the Sunday morning assembly for the Woodland West Church of Christ. I'm glad that you, took the op that you are taking the time uh, to join us for our worship uh, assembly, for our time of worship uh, this morning. And I hope you find it to be really meaningful. Uh, I'm not Randy Todd. Uh, for those of you that know Randy or me, that will come as no surprise. Uh, I'm Phil Pendergraft. I'm sitting in for Randy this morning, literally sitting in. 
uh, because uh, Randy came down uh, sick again this week. Uh, he had another 24-hour bout with fever and, uh, and not feeling well. Uh, he's much better today. I talked to him on my way in, uh, but uh, we're giving him this, this Sunday off. And he's waiting on some test results. Uh, please, uh, please be prayerful for Randy during this time. So this morning I wanted to have a conversation about what's going on around us and what our response to it should be. Uh, you might call this conversation uh, my theology of the virus. <clears throat> now, it's going to be kind of a one-sided conversation because not only do you not get to participate uh, verbally, you're not even here with me uh, this morning in person. So I guess that really makes this sort of a monologue rather than a conversation. Uh, or maybe even worse, it's just me talking to myself. Um, but I'd like to have this conversation. Now to help make things less one-sided, I have, uh, I've solicited questions uh, from a number of you that I'm going to be answering today. Actually, uh, I didn't solicit any questions. Uh, these are my questions that I wrote that I'm going to try to answer today in this conversation, which still makes it pretty one-sided. So I hope you will put up with that as we begin today. Uh, you may not agree with everything that I say today, and that's okay. This is my theology of the virus, uh, although I hope that any disagreement that you might have uh, will be scripturally based because I've tried to base this conversation today uh, on my understanding of scripture. So, I think having laid out all the ground rules, let's get started. Question number one, did God cause the virus? No, I don't believe that God caused the virus. It's not punishment for sin or an attempt to scare anyone into seeking a higher being or a message of any kind to America or any other country in the world. So why is that my answer? Why is that my, uh, uh, my belief? Because I think post the cross, after the cross, I don't, I don't see God working in that way in his world. Now yes, I will freely acknowledge that God used plagues to free his people from Egypt. Uh, he even sent plagues to the people of Israel when, uh, when they uh, had sinned or had strayed away to call them back into uh, relationship uh, with him. But I think the cross changed that. Uh, I think that post the cross, God's primary focus is not on countries, uh, it's not on um, uh, sending punishment, um, his primary focus is on the kingdom of God. In other words, I think the cross changed the playbook and God is now doing different things. See, I don't think God causes bad things to happen. Now, again, I acknowledge that he punished Israel and many of the nations that interacted with Israel in some pretty harsh ways. But that was punishment for sin, and it was done for a specific reason. As he was shaping the nation of Israel so that it would fulfill his salvation plan for his creation. It was a part of what was needed to bring the nation of Israel to the time of Jesus Christ. And Jesus changed everything. I don't think that God is particularly concerned with America or China or any other country today. I do think that he's very concerned and very focused on his kingdom, the kingdom of God. So. The next question I have here is, so what is the kingdom of God? And you know, that's a really great question. 
I'm glad you asked it. <clears throat> it's not really part the point of our conversation today. Uh, and if we really wanted to spend, to delve deeply into it, we could spend way more than the allotted time for this morning. But let's talk about it briefly. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, established at the cross, made up of those who have acknowledged Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who in gratitude for that salvation seek to live lives that are conformed to the likeness of Jesus. From that perspective, the kingdom is the church. But it's bigger than that, because it also encompasses heavenly beings and realities that we don't see yet. It is here and now, but it's also coming. We're in it today, but we don't fully see it or understand it. See, I think God's purpose after the cross is to bring his creation to the point described in Revelation chapter 21, where John writes this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. See, I think that's, that's where we're going, and that's what God's purpose after the cross is. Uh, and I, so I think he's concerned with the kingdom, bringing it to fulfillment, and not with earthly countries or, uh, or kingdoms. All the focus of the New Testament writings are on the kingdom of God and the hearts and minds and spirits of its citizens. I think God is working differently today than he did in the Old Testament. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying he can't do the same things he did in the Old Testament. I think it's a really bad idea as a general principle to say anything about what God can and can't do. Because he's God and we're not. And we don't understand him well enough to be able to make those statements. Uh, so I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying I don't think that he does. And like I said, we could talk for a long time about the kingdom of God, but that's not really the point of our conversation today. So we're going to move on. But I do want to add one more thing on this idea that God doesn't cause bad things to happen. Uh, I know the writer of Hebrews says that God disciplines his children. But while I am not entirely sure what that means, I am pretty sure it doesn't mean that God causes bad things to happen to me to discipline me. And I don't think that the virus is intended as discipline for the world because the Hebrews passage is only talking about the followers of Jesus, not the whole world. Okay, time for the next question. Question number three. Are you saying that God has nothing to do with the virus? Well, actually, no. That's not what I'm saying. You see, God is ultimately responsible for the virus. And now, because you probably think I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, let me explain what I mean. First, I said that I don't think God caused the virus. But I do think he's responsible. And I don't think there's a contradiction between those two statements. Let me tell you why. God is sovereign. God is in control. Now, when we say that in the church, we say that among believers, everybody almost always nods their head and says yes. But I'm not sure that we're always agreeing on the same thing. Because I think we have different understandings of what those ideas mean, of sovereignty and God being in control. Let me tell you what I think it means. 
and for the purposes of this conversation, how I'm using those words. Uh, first, let me give it to you really nice and short and easy. God's team wins in the end. We get to choose a side to be on. Don't be stupid. Let me say that again. God's team wins in the end. We get to choose which side to be on. Choose the winning side. Let me expand on that a little bit. God has a plan and a purpose for his creation. He is going to complete that plan and fulfill that purpose. From this perspective, saying that God is sovereign means that his will is going to be done and his purpose fulfilled. Now God has a plan and a purpose for you and me. He makes that abundantly clear in scripture. You can put it a whole bunch of different ways. He wants us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. He wants us to take up our crosses and follow Jesus. Peter says, God wants no one to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He has a plan and a purpose for every one of us. But listen carefully. That plan or purpose may or may not be fulfilled. So on the one hand, I'm saying God's plan and purpose for his creation is going to be fulfilled. God is sovereign. And he is at work to bring about his purpose for his creation in ways we can't even fathom. And in fact, we already know God's team wins. On the other hand, he has a plan and a purpose for you and me. And that purpose may or may not be fulfilled. So I guess that brings us to the next question. How can God's plan for me not be fulfilled if he is sovereign and in control? Well, it's because he, he has chosen to give you and me a choice in this matter. From the very beginning of creation, God decided to give humanity, men and women, the freedom to choose. The right to choose to follow him or to choose not to follow him. Why did he do this? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's because he doesn't seek people who have to follow him. He seeks people who want to follow him. So he gave us the freedom to choose our team. His desire for each of us is that we make the right choice, but it is still our choice. Now to come to the question about the virus, I think God ultimately is responsible for the virus and for everything else that has happened in his creation because he made a choice. He chose to give us freedom to choose. It was his choice to make. He is sovereign over his creation and he chose to give us the right to choose. And in doing so, that free will gives us the ability to choose rightly and wrongly. In other words, God's purpose and plan for his creation is going to be fulfilled. He's in control of that. His team, his team wins in the end, remember? But I may or may not play a role in that because I get to choose which team to be on. That brings us to question five. If we have free will, does that mean that God is not involved in our lives? Of course not. 
Paul tells us very clearly that God is at work in all things for the good of those who love him. Which is one of the most awe-inspiring and comforting passages in scripture. God, the creator of the universe, who spoke creation into existence, is at work in all things for the good of those who love him. He was at work in the lives of the believers in Rome, to whom Paul wrote these words so many years ago. And he's at work in the lives of the believers today even in the middle of a pandemic. Are you struggling with the stay at home order? Maybe you live alone and you're feeling lonely. God is there and he is at work. Did you lose your job because of the economic challenges caused by the virus? God is at work and he is there. Are you sick or hurting or grieving? God is at work, and he is there. And this is true even if we don't feel God's presence or see his actions. He's still there. Our role in this is simply to believe. See, faith is a choice that we make. Choosing to believe even when we don't see or feel God even in difficult circumstances, choosing to believe that he is at work, that he is faithful to his promises, that he's at work for our good. Now, I'm not talking about blind faith. I'm not even sure that is faith. I'm talking about faith that is a choice. A choice that we make even in the midst of doubts. Echoing the father who encountered Jesus after the transfiguration. Who said, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. Our role is to choose faith. To believe that God is at work in our lives and in his world for the good of those who love him. Now he's also at work through the prayers of his people. You do believe that God answers prayers, don't you? You know, Richard Foster, in his classic book, The Celebration of Discipline, puts it this way. Through prayer, we are working with God to determine the future. Now, it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. But that through prayer, when we come into the Holy of Holies, through the blood of Jesus and we present our praises and our thanksgiving and our supplications and our intercessions before the creator of the universe, he actually listens and he loves us so much that he acts in our lives and in the lives of those we're concerned about. And our world needs prayer. It desperately needs prayer. So I want to invite you to a specific commitment on prayer. I want you right now to set your phones or your watches or your alarms to noon every day. And let's join together in prayer every day at noon. Even when we're physically apart, let's join together in prayer for our families, for our church family, for our community and state and country and for God's world, for healing and blessing and repentance and for the kingdom of God to come in our lives and in his world. Noon each day for five or 10 or even 15 minutes by ourselves, with our families, in person or by Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or even that old technology, the telephone. Let's pause every day. And together, let's determine what's going to happen tomorrow. Together with each other and with God, let's come into his presence and let's pray. Let's commit to praying together every day. 
Because you see, God is not only at work within us and for our good, he wants to be and is at work through us. In a lesson mm, several weeks ago, maybe the last lesson we had together in this building, Randy reminded us of the role that Christians played in some of the early plagues that swept the ancient world. How Christians ministered to the sick and dying when nobody else would. They were different. They showed the love of Jesus and made a huge impact in their world. It called people out of darkness into the light because of the incredible service of these men and women. So my question is, what are you and I doing today? I know some of the things that we're doing inside the church family, cards and calls of encouragement, groceries and toilet paper, even Hawaii shave ice and dessert deliveries. And we should do more of that. Hot fudge Sundays. My second challenge is for us collectively to pick something we're going to do every week to impact somebody else in our church family, whether it's a phone call or a card or something else. At least one, and maybe more if you have time. Be purposeful about picking something to do to impact someone in the family. Maybe it's the phone ministry, calling or, or, uh, or sending cards or groceries, whatever it is. As the stay-at-home orders begin to be relaxed, people will still be working from home, kids will still be out of school, people's lives will still be disrupted. Let's find a way to share God's love with those of the community of faith. And let's commit to finding ways to do that outside the community of faith. To ministering in our neighborhoods, on our streets, in our community. It may not be ministering to those who are sick and dying, as it was in times past, but there are still ways for us to share the love of Jesus, even little ways, with cards and calls and ice cream. We can and should and must find ways to share God's love on our streets and in our neighborhoods. Let's be the church in this time of need. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation. I hope you have as well. As our time comes to a close, let me summarize my thoughts. I don't think God caused or sent the virus, although he is ultimately in control of his creation. In his sovereignty, he has decided to give us free will the right to make our own choices. And I think the virus is but one of countless bad things that have come from our choices. And even in these difficult times, he is at work for our good, working in us and through us in his world. So let's leave with these three challenges. An invitation to pray each day at noon challenge to pick a specific way to serve someone within the church community, and a challenge to do the same in our neighborhoods, finding ways to serve and share God's love in difficult times. Again, I hope you have uh, enjoyed our time together. We anticipate that Randy will be back in his spot, in this spot next week. Please know that the staff and shepherds are available to you in whatever way we can assist you. May God bless you today and each day until we meet again. Be safe. See you soon.
Good morning. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, I would like to share some thoughts about the words that Jesus used when he instituted this supper, as recorded in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. Luke records, And when he took the bread and gave thanks, and broke it, he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I would like us to focus for just a moment on this concept of covenant that he used there. The Greek language really had three words that could be translated as covenant, two of which are used in the New Testament. One is the word diatheke, which is the word Jesus used here and is most often used in the New Testament. The other word is suntheke, which is used a couple of times. Now, a diatheke covenant can be between a superior person and a lesser, such as between a king and his subjects, whereas a suntheke is a covenant made between equals, such as two individuals going into a business contract. And that is the word used in Romans 131 and Luke 22, verse 5. However, this word diatheke that Christ used here in the upper room as he instituted this supper is an arrangement made between one party who has plenary or if you will absolute power which the other party does not have and the other party may either accept or reject but has no authority or power to alter now when we think about this word if god's covenant here instituted by jesus was a soon think a covenant that is, one made between equal parties, all would be lost regarding our salvation because we cannot faithfully keep our part of the covenant as our relationship with God would then be considered on a footing of equals. However, a diatheke covenant is different because it is God's exalted position as our creator who has unequal authority with an unequal party of sinners. And therefore, the onus of the fulfillment of the covenant's promises of salvation is on the greater party, the Lord himself. God's glory is at stake in this covenant. And so he guarantees the fulfillment of his word for his name's sake, which means our redemption is secure. Now, Recently, Randy sent out an email. He talked about doubting Thomas and how at times we Christians may have some insecurities or questions or doubts about our salvation. And he encourages us not to let those doubts arise, but to be sure and confident in our relationship with God and in our salvation. And that is what this covenant means. It means that God himself has made this covenant and that the onus for fulfillment of that salvation is on him, and it is sure and steadfast. But Jesus went on to say, this is a new covenant in my blood. And what does that mean, in? Well, in this case, it would mean by means of. His blood, his body on that cross, sealed the covenant, and he became the personal guarantor of the promised salvation contained within that covenant. And so as we remember his death this morning and we think about his body on that cross and we consider the blood that he's poured out for us, let us not doubt, but let us be reassured that God himself stands behind this covenant, sealed with the very precious blood of Christ and the body that bore the wounds for our transgressions and iniquities. This is why then the author of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, a covenant which will never pass away, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will. And may, the work, may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope these thoughts will help you as you focus on Christ's death this morning. And so before we partake of that, let us go to our Father in prayer. Holy Father, thank you so very much for your love 
and your boundless grace towards us, that you were willing to make this agreement with us, though we were not worthy of it, that we might have redemption from our sins and the hope of eternal life with you. We pray now that as we remember the body and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the blood that was poured out that established this new covenant relationship that we have with you, that we will do so in a way that brings honor to you and to him. And may glory be to our Lord Savior forever and ever for this sacrifice. Amen. Now, great the 